studios in New York City. This is Charlie Rose. Welcome to the broadcast. Tonight, Sean Penn for the hour. A personal note, he is somebody I like very much. He is smart, he is perceptive, he is fun to be with, and he is incredibly talented. There is a depth in his work and in his character. He is also among the best of his generation of actors. Ask anybody who has worked with him. If he's not the greatest actor in America, I don't know who is. Is that right? I think he is. I and mean, for his generation, certainly. He's. He's a real pleasure to direct. I think he's the best actor of his generation, and I just wanted to go the best first. And uh, I had heard he had stopped acting, but uh, he responded immediately to the script and said yes right away. Did he tell you why he responded to it? What he's, was it about this role? He said of... that when he read it, he, he, he cried. And uh, he, he just felt that uh, it was a, uh, a good script, and he wanted to do it. Yeah. He has three new movies out, The Game, She's So Lovely, and you turn yet despite so much acclaim he doesn't love acting as he told me in a november 1995 interview so i don't enjoy acting so i i think that you know the way i kid myself about it is it's like if i've already got a job if i'm directing so why do it primarily it's it's got to do with being able to con to, to to pick your material because you wrote it uh, and then direct it as one process. To be out there as an actor for hire looking for things, the, the likelihood of coming across something that's going to be sort of harmonious with whatever it is that's part of your own search at that time, whatever you're trying to figure out, whatever your obstacles are at that time, and not take your mind off it, but actually enhance that bit of your journey. What he does like is the contentment he gets from his wife, Robin Wright Penn, and his two children. He sat down with me in Los Angeles over the weekend to catch up on his life and his work. Man, a lot has changed since I last saw you. 1995, November, uh, Dead Men Walking. Right. Um, you now got three movies coming out. You're back with Mrs. Penn. Mm -hmm. uh, the two kids are older. Mm -hmm. You seem at a great place. Yeah, I like to think that I am in a good place. To, you know. Never trust it for more than a day. So. <laughs> you just go for the day. Huh? That's right. Yeah. We talked last time a lot about acting and what you didn't like about it. And now all of a sudden I look around and there's the game. She's so lovely. You turn, coming up thin red line. Well, what really happened is uh, I kind of bookended myself because I had been a long time fan of Terry Malick's movies and then had gotten to know him a bit yeah. at a certain point and kind of committed uh, blindly to whatever if he would come back and do a movie. So then when by the time that he did he came around and said he was going to do this The Thin Red Line and that was going to be a year from that time and then uh, that was right at a time when I was about to do something I'd committed in my, in my head I'd committed to John Cassavetes She's So Lovely on the front end of that year. So you can't really move and direct something when you know you just have a year. It's very, that would be limiting. It takes me that long to, to cut a movie. So I was kind of be, being bookended like that. I, I, when things would come in, I, I took them and paid the bills. And yeah. well, those two you did for almost for friendship reasons, in part. Yeah, you, I you mean. You promised Malik that you would. Yeah. Well, the, yeah, but the friendships is, 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 is reasons are the same, are, are the deepest reasons you want to do anything creatively also yeah. because you find that, you know, you have friendships because you have a kind of common sensibility with, 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 with things. I mean, I, I had been involved with She's So Lovely for eight years or so. I mean, I'd, I'd been longer than that because I'd been with, originally going to do it with John Cassavetes and then, then I was at one time thinking about directing the movie. So it was something I felt an attachment to. So have you not, in fact, changed your ideas that you really don't want to act very much and that what you want to do is direct because no, it's more I've, satisfying? I've taken a crash course in my own disdain for the process of acting. <laughs> and and come each, out? Well, you know, you, you get, you, yeah, there's some of these movies and movies that I, I'm glad I did. So there's that, you know, it's in the same way that you're glad that... Um, you know, some girl in high school broke your heart, and oh, I got to learn out of that one. Yeah. But I don't want to go pursue that heartbreak again, or that kind of thing. But you don't, 
but movies are only feel like that when you're when you're in them, and you have a tendency to to let yourself forget and get involved, and then you do it, and you're miserable, and then you've done it, and you're glad you did it. But uh, but I would like to start ma making a point of keeping my time clear to to sit down and write and to direct uh, movies. Direct those things that you write. Yeah. What are you working on now? A couple different things. Uh, mixing things up in a laboratory. I want to come back to that moment, but let me just stay with acting for a second. It, when you look at all these performances, which one do you like the best? Well, I, I think more in terms of what, what movie I feel particularly invested in, in the, in, in the way that I, you know, I think that this idea that, that actors or artists should be aware of the times they're living in, the one that I feel is in, most important to, to if, there's, if, if movies are important, because I'm never sure about that, but is uh, sh she's so lovely. So there's something about it that's just, uh, it, it displays love as the mess that it is at best. <laughs> and and accepts it in a way that that doesn't seem to uh, attach itself to the kind of emotional political correctness that you, you get uh, surrounded by so much of the time. It's about love, and it's about the sort of craziness of love. Here he is; he goes away for ten years, and he comes back, and he hasn't forgotten how much he loved her. Right. And he's going to have her back. Yeah. I mean, that's the craziness of it. Right. Right. But you know, it's easy. It's much easier, I think. For people to celebrate Romeo and Juliet, where you, you where a case today would be made that you're romanticizing teenage suicide, yeah. you know, I, it's intensely uh, romantic and passionate that they uh, take their own lives because they're not going to be able to, they think they're not going to be able to be together. But if then if if you have a movie like She's So Lovely, where in the whimsy of the of the, sto of the style of the movie, a mother leaves her kids to be able to be with the man she loves, this is of course obscene to people, but it's all right if they killed themselves. So, yeah. yeah. How is it, I mean, when you and I talked before, you and Robin were split. Right. And you talked almost openly about the pain of that. Right. And now you're back, and now you're even working together. Yeah. Your idea? Well, she came to her senses, just generally. <laughs> <laughs> she just got smart. Yeah, you know, I think... You no longer just describe her as the mother of my children. No, no, that's a self-protective <laughs> term. <laughs> but was it, I mean, how was it to be there with her acting after, you know? Great, great. You know, she was... it's a, a great role for a woman. Yeah, I think the best of what we had professionally and personally came back like riding a bike. You know, it's just the tires were flat for a while there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me talk about the other movies and come back to some of this. All right. Uh, U-Turn, yeah. Oliver Stone, Nick Nolte. Uh, well, a, a very aggressive comedy, uh, <laughs> aggressive. film noir, yeah. uh, black comedy, uh, directed by a guy who's got an, it's just an enormous wealth of raw talent, but uh, who also <laughs> reminds me of one of those, the, those, you know, those pug dogs that are constantly trying to drain this chronic sinus problem there. <laughs> Yes, I know. Yes, kind of, I know. You know, <laughs> that's Oliver Stone. To me. Very it's like <laughs> the pugster. Yeah, but he's a savant in a way. You know, his focus on what he's doing is yeah. is great, and I think you know at his at the very least he's bold, and at his best he's got a certain kind of genius, and uh, and I think the movie reflects that. You're happy with? Satisfied. I'm happy with it. It's a, it's I, I it's I, I would have more much more of a personal investment in something like She's So Lovely because it's, I think it's guided by the characters specifically in his, he, this is, the, you're, you're on a, a, the Oliver Stone ride much more when you, when you make one of, one of his movies for, for one reason because so much of what he does, he does in post-production. Uh, so you, you come there and you, you're playing scenes much like you would in, in anything else and doing your work the same way but the way in which it's manipulated to tell the story later in, in, uh, in uh, his post-production process with his, his editor and so on and sound people uh, it, it becomes a surprise to you what it's going to be. That's why you like directing. Well there's that, there's that. I think the, I think the, I like directing because I like directing but I I think why I don't like acting is is it, to a degree where, you know, bad luck sometimes, as well as just generally, even in the best circumstances, 
you know, you're tearing, just tearing yourself apart at the wrong time of day is the way I've always felt about it. I always felt like, you know, with directing, you, you do all of your emotional work as a writer, and then you come there and orchestrate somebody else uh, really doing the, the, the difficult work, the acting. Um, and, and that's on a schedule that's dictated by, mo mo you know, money and, and things like that. So when I write, which is, to me, the closer equivalent than directing to acting, writing is, uh, I pick my times. I go to the typewriter when I want to. I don't have to get up at 6 o'clock in the morning and be, be there like you do as, as an actor. It wasn't because you just spent so much. I mean, you were so good. And there was so, you were so much on the edge of giving your own emotion. And in the end, you couldn't find a connection that was satisfying in terms of a journey you were on. I, yeah, I mean, that's a, maybe a more articulate way of describing something I haven't got completely in, in tow myself. Now, I, I, I wouldn't say that that's an inaccurate observation, but, um, but I know that, I f that, that when I started to recognize that acting was something that made me uncomfortable, I, it was at the same time that I recognized that it had been making me uncomfortable from, from, from the start. Yeah. Terrence Rafferty and others have said, looked at this unhappiness with you and said that people with great gifts sometimes get bored with their gifts and that it happened to Brando in his 50s and it happened to you when you were 30. Well, bored with a gift is an interesting... I mean, I, I don't know that it's true. I don't believe that it's true of Marlon Marlo. Brando either. You know, I think that, that, there's a, that one becomes more protective of whatever it was that... that or that whatever it is that they feel that they have to... to uh, um, to exercise and, 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 and the ways in which they have a, a craft to, to do that. And uh, especially in a case like Marlon, when you know, the, the, the spotlight goes on and says, all right, you're it for the, for the last hundred years and for the next hundred years, you know, do your stuff. And that that, that, that becomes such a... A burden. A, a burden, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's like you're carrying around. Everybody has said, you've changed acting. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's... I don't think you can really be as aware of that as everybody else is. But Bob Dylan actually had a great line that wasn't particular to that, but it was about you know any kind of self self consciousness that happens. He's like he, he, he say you know what's the worst thing about being famous? He says well when when people remind me who I am, and I think that that. When, the, when, you, when there's a kind of general label like that, like you're the, the Marlon Brando being the greatest actor, whatever, that, that becomes quite a burden, yeah. Well, was it a burden from you when they said early on this is the best actor of his generation? No, I, ta I took it as just a discerning audience. <laughs> <laughs> no, or people of great judgment writing. <laughs> no, I was much... I, you know, I, I think that was a nice thing to hear when, when one heard it, but I, no, that wasn't so much uh, a part of me feeling burdened. I just felt burdened by the process itself. Because? I just want to, one more attempt to find out the process because in the end it left you feeling It just empty. didn't feel good. Right. Empty. Yeah. And yeah. nothing has changed about that? No. I mean, you've been doing these films for all these reasons. Yeah, I mean, but you, you know, know you every time you go like, out there, it's going to make you feel not satisfied at the end. Yeah, I mean, you tend not to start a film unfueled. You, you know, your tanks get refueled, and you don't feel empty, and you mm -hmm. say, well, maybe I'll get through this one. But you don't. You said sometimes that to be out there as an actor for hire is unlikely to find you know, some harmony with a search that you're on. You don't find that. You know? Yeah, that's Whatever you're looking for for yourself as an individual, you don't find it. Yeah, I think that everybody in, 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 uh, in film or in writing or whatever the, the arts, if I call it that, uh, it has to be on some kind of journey where there's, where there's a kind of progression where you, you don't walk over the same path twice and that, the, that you're most uh, valuable to something that you don't have, you haven't uh, resolved entirely. Where, where, where it's most exciting to you is where it's most exciting to an audience, and, if, and, and that's kind of going into something that's immediate, of immediate interest to you. Between 91 and I think about 96, you made two movies, Carlito's Way and 
dead man walking, I guess. Yeah. Right? Did you feel any sense of, man, I wish I was there, I wish I was out there? Or all the creativity that you have within you was finding expression and doing other things, whatever yeah, it was? Yeah, it was for me, creatively, probably the best time, because I was writing so much. So I, I, I think that that, yeah. uh, but no, I was, uh, I had learned a lesson which I'm trying to reteach myself, which is don't read scripts, because when you read them, uh, you start to work, you, and, and when you start to work, you seduce yourself, and the next thing you know, you're in the middle of a, a movie shooting in some location saying, what the hell am I doing? You don't know what happened, you just got hooked and went for it. Yeah. Here is what you said about films. And I love this quote. I'm interested in films only when the filmmaker's dreams are being shared with me, not when he or she is saying you don't have enough dreams yourself. So I'm going to make some up for you when I go into the theater. I'm hoping that people will not lie to me. The reason so many of these people don't look inside themselves and ask, what do I really want to say, is that they're cowards. That's a real indictment that people are doing this because they have no confidence in their own soul. No confidence that they have something to say. That's right. That's right. I think I also said because I get catchphrases in my head, and I, I think it's particularly true of the American cinema. Not that I can say that I'm all that well exposed to foreign cinema, but what I do see of it, it seems that there's still a shred of of, of filmmaking as a, as an art of expression, and here it's all about being the the impressive. Right. And, and, and to dazzle. I'm going to impress you with the pyrotechnics of what I can do rather than express to you something that I uniquely know. Right. That right. I want to share with you. And it's not timeless. It's very of one particular time and it seems to suit a particular uh, type of stimulation uh, that, that, that's, that is, you know, pop or oriented art. And I'm. Uh, I just don't think that it's valid in the long run. But then tell me what's valid. Tell me where you think it's being done right. What movie, what place, you know? I want to know what your dream is and what your sense of all of this is. Where does it... Well, in the same way that we like to believe, and I do believe that, that you know, mankind, womankind, shares a, a kind of bottom line sensibility about love, uh, about pain, about joy, um, about comfort. I think in the same way, a man of the 90s sh shares a common sensibility that in, in, entirely to the same degree with, with, with someone of the 40s and will of someone in, you know, space age years. and. So when, it's, when, when one stays true to those basic principles of kind of what we care about and what we live for, those ones that transcend particular epochs and that sort of thing, um, the, and, and does it in, in, a, in a way that they are sure of, that they've lived, that they understand, or that they question openly, um, they, they're, then you're sh you're sh the only thing you can share with anybody is commonality. You can't really teach anybody uh, anything about their own heart. You can tell about your own dream, and if they can sh somehow connect, as that's my dream too. You can or remind that's my them. passion too, or that's mine. Right. There's a great story that that I I don't like to use the word God often because I'm not sure what that is. But but uh, you, but you'll get the gist about a young couple who has a child, a newborn. And they bring it home from the hospital, and then they have also a, a four-year-old. And he said, the four-year-old says, Mommy, Daddy, I want to see the baby. They've put the, the baby in the crib in another room. So, of course, darling, they start to walk with her to the other room. She says, No, Mommy, no, Daddy, I want to see the baby alone. And they're both a little nervous because they've heard about sibling jealousies and that sort of thing. They say, Well, why do you want to see the baby alone, honey? She says, I can't tell. It's a secret. And they're nervous, and they say, No. And she starts to weep, and but then a couple of days go by, and she refuses to see her, her, her new sibling under any other circumstances. And the couple is laying in bed one night, and they say, you know, maybe we're depriving her of something that's really going to be important. And there's an intercom in the room. Worst comes to worst, we can rush in. So the next day, they 
have led her and they watch her disappear behind the baby's door and she closes it and they rush to the intercom. And there's about 30 seconds of silence and then the four-year-old's pitter-patter of her feet move to the crib and you hear her whisper to the, the baby, tell me about God, I'm forgetting. And I think that artists have to be that baby. Yeah. You know, that, that baby's got to be the speaker. And it's, it's, that's, what, that's what artists should do. They should just understand the most they can do is remind people of their own worth and hope. You said earlier you're not sure that movies can do that. You're not sure that movies can make a difference. Well, one of the things that's discouraging, of course, is you, you, you make a movie, which I believe has that. You know, She's So Lovely, I think, has that in, in, the, in the way that it doesn't exclude um, sort of uh, impoliteness uh, from the, 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 pr the process of, of, of committing to, to a love and believing in a love. That, in, that if you put, you know, there's nothing insane about a lion. There's something insane when you put a, a baby in a lion's cage. And it's, it, it, you know, this is a lion's cage and everybody's a baby here. And so, so certain kinds of behavior that we'd rather not look at occurs. Uh, but you can't let that stop you from believing in whatever put you in that cage and whatever you love in that cage. You can't decide that you hate all lions because it attacked you or the baby, you know. Did Cassavetes ever talk to you about She's So Lovely? I mean, he wanted you to star in the film back when he wrote it. He wrote it years ago. I mean, he wrote it a number of years before he died, didn't he? Or did he write it near the end of his death? Yeah, I think about he, somewhere in the last 10 years yeah. uh, before he died. And yeah, we talked about it at length because we were going to do it together for about two years, but we couldn't get it financed. Does he represent for you, in some sense, of somebody who did have the right idea and who had the right sensibility and who understood art separate from commerce and was out there on the front line? Yeah, I think as American filmmakers go, he, he was the best of it so far. Who else is there? Well, I see films sometimes that I respond very strongly to. I'm, you know, it's, hard, it's always hard in these moments to recall what I'm thinking about. How about of. in France? How about in Europe? I mean, they're, they're there. You see the films. I mean, the, the films, the Acousta Ritz are uh, astonishing films. Um, uh, as well, there was a. There's this, there, are, there are Americans all, also doing it, but they don't. It just doesn't come to mind right now. Mostly there was a yeah. you know, lasting but, emotional effect. Here's what else that's interesting about how you see this. It's not just the studios. I mean, a lot of people say oh, it's the problem with Hollywood. It's a problem with the studios. I mean, your finger is equally pointed at actors and directors yeah. who take the money and run. Yeah. Yeah, I think that, you know, you can't, you, you can't make a movie, you know, unless it's a cartoon. You can't make a movie without uh, actors and directors. And I, and I think that there has been a kind of mass selling of, the, of their souls. Take Dead Man Walking, where you got a nomination for, and all of a sudden you end up, and it doubles your salary, what the hell it does, right? I mean, they, they want to pay you more money. Yeah. Do they, are they willing to listen to you anymore? Does your... Well, what happens is you, 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 you the, the doubled money figure is one I haven't been able to collect on, because there's still, it doesn't matter who you are, if, uh, you know, if um, Mel Gibson wants to do, uh, uh, you know, a Costa Rica movie, right. he's not going to get his 20, 30, whatever millions whatever of dollars get. that he gets. You know, they will offer actors a lot of money to do movies where the actor commercially is in sync commercially with the material. And so there are whole careers that are based on the actors and, and the studios and the writers and directors of those kinds of films finding that harmony, looking for those projects. Agencies are built on recognizing and putting the packaging together of those kind of movies. And they're almost assured a certain level of success because of the way that they're going to promote them and that they have an actor who in that context will mean a lot. But you're not going to get that well paid for something that, that uh, you know, the smaller films. And that's the, dis the what's dis most discouraging is you know, not only in a lot of the films that I've cared most about, that I've been involved in, but in a lot of the ones that I care most about from the outside. You know, there was a film that I did respond to very strongly a few years ago was uh, 
Robert Altman's movie, Vincent and Theo. Oh yeah, me too. And nobody went. You know, and and, and that's that's what's that's discouraging. That's why I wonder if it's it's not that I don't think it's important. You know, I know that films are important because they're important to me. When I when I respond like that to a film, they're inspiring. Uh, they make me feel less alone in the world. But but I'm uh, but they need some kind of uh, audience participation beyond what they're getting. Let me just talk a little bit about about where you are, because in back and personal stuff. Um, you have been talking in a couple of things that I've read about growth and about love and about the constancy. I mean, you do, this is where I started, you get a real sense that you've matured or you've come to somewhere. Can you? I mean, is it just time? You know, all of us, in a sense. Sort of well, I've been, a, a long time ago, I was making a movie with Christopher Walken, and we were sitting between set, set up some, at some point, and I, I, I was going through some particular roller coaster ride emotionally at the time and I just felt weary and I said Chris I said is it you know you're older than I am I said, you know is it always this roller coaster you know it's always like and he says it's always the same roller coaster you just learn to enjoy the ride you know? <laughs> I think that it's as you know Bukowski used to talk about the you know, the, the, the one thing that we should seek beyond anything else is comfort yeah I feel more comfortable because I don't know. I think you get bored with the things that make you uncomfortable. Well, when you were at what some might say your most wild, the wildest you were in your life, was that because you were uncomfortable? Because you weren't happy? Because you didn't have a constancy? Because I think it was. I think I avoid the circumstances that. If one is to look at them, clearly they're going to respond. Um, you know, I think that if, if we were to look at our, um, our government too clearly, we might find ourselves in some kind of militia. It's, it's, it's hard to look at the world around us, whether it's a microcosm and, and of, of, of silliness like most of Hollywood is, or you know the big picture where there's children starving all over the world and 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 spend a lot of time very focused on it and not react yeah. uh, so I think I was reacting to things that I probably have just been a little bit more uh, choosy about what I look hard at it's just it's refocusing um, I don't know that it's a healthier thing because I, I, I think somebody's got to do something somebody's got to shake it up you know and and whether you're shaking it up in a way that seems like you, you know, you're just hitting your fist against a stone wall whining, which often I felt like I was doing, uh, or shaking it up by some kind of actual activism, uh, legitimate activism, I think that there's this, that spirit's gotta, gotta be allowed to live. And it's much harder, I think, now than ever for, for it to live. When anybody ever steps off the line, you, you, you see a lot of flack. Bukowski, you mentioned him. I mean, I never understood why you didn't do Barfly. Well, the, because the property was not introduced to me by Hank. It had been introduced to me by Dennis Hopper. And uh, th that script. Yeah. Uh, I knew books, but I didn't know that screenplay. Yeah. And um, so by the time I was talking to Bukowski about it, uh, I, I felt uh, committed to Dennis Hopper directing it. And Barbe Schroeder owned, owned the piece right. and wanted to direct it one way or the other. And wanted to so, make the error for it? Or? Well, he would have been fine doing it with me, but he, if he were the director. Yeah, and you wanted Dennis, only Dennis to do it. I had asked if he would, because if nothing was happening with it, if he'd step yeah. aside, but uh, not because of, no, no reflection on him as a director, it's just it, it, yeah. my commitment was elsewhere. The connection between you and Dennis, I assume your son is named after Dennis. Well, let's put it this way. I'm not ashamed of the connection to this <laughs> by naming him Hopper, but I'm... Uh, is there yeah, some other Hopper no, in your I background? Just, I just like the... We like the name. All right, but stick with me on this. I mean, the people right. that you like, Dennis, Bukowski you like a lot. Yeah. Uh, you... Who else? Uh, Cassavetes you liked? A lot. Brando you like? Mm -hmm. A lot. Nicholson. Yeah. You like a lot. What is it they share? 
that's a commonality for you? They have raging talents that you, you know, I would go for that, you know, you, you, you tend to love these guys. It's, it's almost as when you're a, a director and you're in casting, you know, and you're choosing, choosing actors, it's, it's just the actors you, ha you have an immediate affection for. You know, with people, I do judge a book by its cover, but not the cover that they present so much as the first feeling that you get about somebody. Yes. And those people are all people I had a great feeling about. Authentic? Yeah. Yeah. That's probably the, the word that describes that uh, cast of characters best. Yeah. Authentic. How about Rebel? Well, if you're authentic in an inauthentic society, you're rebellious. <laughs> <laughs> when you look, those guys, you know, you'd said something really neat about them once that I read. Um, these are guys who've gotten as much pain as they can take, who've come up against very high levels of, <laughs> uh, of histrionics, like everyone does. These are guys whose soul survived, and that to me is an inspiration. Yeah. I mean, you know, Jack Nicholson, not only has his soul survived as a person, but as an artist. You talk about people, somebody saying that, that, that artists get bored with their own gifts. This guy's so still in love with acting, and, yeah. you know, and that's a, that's a great spirit. But here's what I don't get. I mean, I know I'm, I'm struggling with why you don't love acting. I know you've tried to tell me. We've talked about expression and impression, impressive, expressive. De Niro loves it, Pacino loves it, Travolta loves it, all of them considered the best of their generation and beyond, but you don't love it. Well, I think there are been... And got, Nicholson loves it. Imagine how many women were in love with Warren Beatty, okay? <laughs> Warren Beatty is one choice. He's not the choice that I would make. I okay, but... <laughs> 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 Although I like him very much, <laughs> you know, and I respect him and I respect acting. Yeah. I just don't want to yeah, but. <laughs> you don't want to what? <laughs> <laughs> you know. yeah. All right, well, stay with me on this, though. All right, so uh, Madonna, same thing. I mean, tons of men would love to be married to Madonna, but... Yeah, well, I didn't, I didn't love to be married to her. But she's, uh, again, a heck of a person. You admire her? Yeah, I think yeah, she's Yeah, we terrific. talked about that. Yeah. yeah. But it was the, cel there is some belief, it was all that celebrity thing that just drove you nuts. And not so much that she was getting it, but that you had to be subjected to it. Because it was so alien to where you wanted to be. Yeah, I don't think that that necessarily was the, uh, that might have expedited uh, the demise of that marriage. But I think I, uh, you know, mistook a, a a great first date for a wedding partner and um, you know and somebody who's a terrific person but it was not a it wasn't a match meant to be you know which is how I feel about acting too it just wasn't a match made to be mm. you said one time that acting is like an ugly girl to you who's beautiful to everybody else yeah same thing the Warren Beatty idea yeah you understand why everybody else thinks it's beautiful yeah but it, for me, well, you know, the mathematics of the face are just <laughs> right, and the hair does yeah, this, it's, and it's, it smells good, and everything. And I don't want. I don't. <laughs> but writing does. Yeah. And people might say that's a boring girl, and you'd say, maybe boring for you, buddy. Yeah. Well, they don't know her behind closed doors. <laughs> she takes her glasses off and <laughs> lets the hair down. That <laughs> would just. Go with me on this, too. You're now smoking less because you're running. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You've only smoked one, two, three, four. That's the right. The last time we were together, you smoked four in the first three minutes. That's right. You know, one after the other. That's right. Now, what are you doing? You're just getting healthy this because is, you're getting... My daughter's all over me on oh, this Oh, really? One. Yeah. That'll make a difference. It makes a big difference, particularly when, you know, it's uh, just sitting here doing, out here and doing an interview, you know. 400 miles away, it's you get away with a little She's more. She's gonna watch this interview, though. She, she, no, it's on too late. Oh, it's, it's school year. <laughs> it's school year, <laughs> so she can't see it. Uh, I have an enormous admiration, and I make no bones about it for you because of your artistic sensibilities. But you look back on some of this stuff. I mean, the scene where you and Madonna are breaking up, and the helicopters overhead, yeah. and the SWAT, what the, the um, yeah, SWAT, SWAT surrounded the house. Surrounding the house. She's out there in a car. Yeah. And what are you thinking? 
Well, I was eating my cereal at the time, and the first thing I heard was the helicopter. Yeah. And then I heard all the cars coming up the driveway, and then I uh, kept eating my cereal, and I had a, a certain sense of what was going on, especially when the PA system on the helicopter started saying, Mr. Penn, come out of the house. And, uh, With your hands up. Which I had no intention of doing. <clears throat> and uh, I then stepped to the garage door, and I told them they didn't need a warrant. I could see that they had one of the co-owners of the house in the car. And I went back to the cereal and I waited and I heard the windows break and all they were worried about their deputies because it had been announced to them that I had guns in the house. Which I replied, yes I do, but I don't see any reason to use them this morning. I'm just having breakfast. <laughs> and I went back in the kitchen. And the I'm not in a I'm killing like, frame of mind. Not today. I was, <laughs> it was early. I'd been up all night arguing. and uh, With her? Yeah. And so, yeah, it was, it was, uh, it's very funny when I think about it now. <laughs> yeah, I know. And it was funny then. It was less funny in between at some point. There was a, a point of time. But, uh, yeah. It's now, did you at the wedding when you got married, going back to the beginning of this? Did I take a shot at a yeah, helicopter? Yeah, at a helicopter. Uh, what's the statute of limitations on that? Uh, it's very possible that You I might did. have. <laughs> Somebody did. It might have been you. Yeah. <laughs> now, what does this say? Oh, that's madness. I mean, uh, you know, because uh, a handgun is never going to be accurate enough yeah. for that range, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so if it was accurate, it would have been... Well, at least there would have been a kind of clarity of thought. Yeah. <laughs> so, it's, it's, anybody who would shoot a handgun at a helicopter was not engaged in clear thought. That's right. <laughs> Even that's, though it was on right. his yeah. wedding day. Yes, you need a rifle to scope. You know, <laughs> <laughs> All right, just to have fun for a moment. You, so when you would go into bars, uh -huh. why would you punch out people? Well, I didn't they go, always started, didn't they? Yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they did. <laughs> now, you know, you, you get a certain kind of reputation, and it becomes like, a, you, you know, the, the old gunfighter syndrome. Yeah, you bet. And, and, and particularly, you know, little bars out, to, out of town, things like that, you get into beefs, people just looking to, you know. I mean, I've still got some guy in England who, who gets to go to the movies and say, you see that scar there above his eye? I did that. That was me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He came in and I get a left cross. Yeah, and so you become a sign of, you know, a map to, you know, celebrity scrapes. <laughs> <laughs> when you were going through that period, was it just... Well, I was more, my life was more, uh, took, took place when the lights went out more, and I think you had anybody gets into otter situations yeah. when you're drinking and a lot right. and do, doing that. You know, I've got a family and I'm home, but I don't, you know. Is life more fun today or? Listen, I, as far as the stuff like with paparazzi and all that kind of stuff, you know, would I, would I do it again? Yeah, only harder. harder. You know? Well, you could argue, and I want to get you, no, what, with, you know, you could argue that what you, your rebellion against that intrusion was a forerunner of how bad it was going to get, leading to tragedy. Yeah, it sure did. And, you know, I think we, 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 we don't live in a democracy anymore. We live in a hypocrisy. I mean, it, it, if, if you talk about invading people's privacy or you talk about, yeah, there's, there's, they talk about the, the First Amendment, I think I'm a d strong believer in. I think whatever is done about this, you have to preserve the integrity of the First Amendment. But at the same time, if you have a business and you hire a secretary and she's pretty and you say, hey, you want to go out with me, you can be guilty of sexual harassment. But if, it, 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 now I'm not a woman, I don't know, do they feel trapped by that? If they have, if they have that job, automatically do they feel trapped? If they feel trapped, then they, there should be some recourse. I don't know if it's legal. Uh, but when uh, someone in the public eye feels trapped, you walk out of a restaurant and you feel trapped. If somebody's a driver, whether that's a drunk driving issue or it's not, I'm not, I don't know. But I do know what those chases are like. I've been in them many times. Because you, you, you are surprised by something, your quality of life is chipped away at systematically by those people. And by the bounty that's put on your head by the, by the magazines that buy their, their work. Uh, and at a, at a certain point, you say, you know, this is, this is a country that's supposed to protect minorities as well as majorities. And if the minority is in the public eye, they have to have some kind of uh, quality of life protected also. 
How you do it, I'm not sure. Uh, I, you know, I think there are some, some good options. You know, one of them might be to, that you can't profit from the, maybe you need only salaried ph uh, photographers rather than the mass bounty that they put out. And uh, you can't additionally profit from particular shots. I don't, it, it, it is one idea. But this kind of thing has been coming for a long time. What's, in the end, offensive about it for you? Is it simply getting in my space, invading my privacy, limiting my freedom? Well, that's a big part of it. It's no different than if I decide to have this conversation like this. You know, you get, yeah, it's just, you know, <laughs> yeah. that thing. Right. And, you know, so there's that. There is privacy. There is just, you know, living your life. There is the way that a still camera flash affects you. Uh, it's, it, you know, you know why, should, why should your heart be jolted like that as you walk out and somebody jumps out of the bushes or, or you look to your left and there's a lens pointed at you from a car? It's an it's a upsetting thing. Yeah. And if you say to them, look, I'll give you a chance to take a photograph, but let's just do it in a civil way, that doesn't go. No, that doesn't go because once they get that photograph, they continue. They stay after you and they provoke you. They say nasty things and try to provoke you. you know, have you, though, found some, I mean, have you in, in terms of wherever you are, it, 37, found some sense of, of look for some balance to it. I mean, you're in a business that's a public business. You want to market your product. Not just you, the best artist in the world, you know, are there. They have exhibitions and they show their painters, whether it's Robert Rauschenberg at the Guggenheim now, whoever it might be. Um, how do you finally square that, some sense? I square it by coming here where you and I have made a choice, both made a choice to be here and do this. Right. You have your show. I have it's, you know, some movie who you want to be so with. Yeah, and your time to, right. to do it. And there is a time and a, and, and a place for it. Um, and I think that to a large degree, this should apply to even you know, political candidates as well. I think that, you know, how can you expect uh, a president to make rational decisions where he, where he doesn't have a rational life at, in any way? Uh, there's there's got to be some, you know, at bottom line it comes down to some kind of human respect that doesn't, it doesn't exist with these people. What, what are your politics? Uh, they swing from the far left to the far right. Where would they be on the far right? Almost libertarian on some questions of... Well, the far right being, I, I guess if, uh, if, if we define the far right by being conservative, they'd be, uh, you know, I would say that, the, right that to bear, I don't believe, right to, oh, the right to bear arms? Yeah. Yes, I, 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 uh, I have very mixed feelings about that. Uh, I think, again, it's, it's another one that should be more strongly preserved than it has been. At the same time, there's got to be some kind of psychological regulation. There's got to be some kind of psychological education in the country, but it applies to all of these rights that get abused, though. And, uh, you know, we live in this country where we, we've got about nine-tenths of the active serial killers are all in the United States of America. Why is that? <clears throat> because of the unspoken emotional oppression, the damage that's done to people at, at a young age, the damage that's allowed to occur, the lack of education that's allowed to occur, and the way that we are all right with that as long as the rich are comfortable. Mm -hmm. And that are, and because our artists lie. Your dad was blacklisted, mm -hmm. Leo Penn. Did that have any shaping influence on you, or was it all when you were not? Uh, well, I think, I think that he has a, he had a shaping influence on me, and that that's a kind of the values that encouraged him to take the position he did. Just to take are the, the values position. that he imparted to you. Believe what you believe in. Don't be uh, sidetracked by what's going to make it easy. You know, it wasn't easy for him. And uh, a lot of things in a, in a, you know, a much uh, lighter, lighter arena haven't been easy for me. But uh, I think well, that... What hasn't been easy for you? What hasn't been easy for me is dealing with a lot of the, you know, the things that we've been talking about. Crap. Oh, and I mean, the most important one being it isn't easy for me to reconcile that audiences have, don't go to the, the kinds of movies that, that I, I, I think are productive. 
you know, so that's what I mean by lighter arena. See, at least it seems lighter, but maybe it's not, you know, in the sense that, you know, I think that artists have always dictated a certain kind of social consciousness. They've been these sort of, uh, uh, I think Ramsey Clark said it, the, the unspoken or unsung legislators. And, uh, I, you know, I, I think it's time that they take responsibility for that. You know, that's extremely discouraging. I don't know what you're working on now, but what kinds of stories do you want to tell? Do you know? I mean, are the things that you, do you have a, a backlog of ideas that you want to express, not yeah. impress? Yeah. What yeah. kinds of things? Well, they come in, in snippets, and then bit by bit over time, they start to, to find form. and You find out which ideas are all connected to one story, and you start to put them together, and that's the way I work when I write. So on a daily basis, I'm, I'm thinking about things, and they fall into categories of which, which of the stories, because I know landscapes of stories in my head, and then I know uh, sort of emotional ideas, and those are separate things, and you find out which ones merge. You're now directing your parents. Producing a play. Pro oh, you're producing a play. Remembrances, is it? Right. Uh, you've directed your mom a couple of times, both times, right? Right. Uh, yes. She was an Indian runner and, and one role, and then she had a larger role in Crossing Guard. Right. Yeah. And your dad had a small part in... Yeah, it hit the cutting room floor. <laughs> so sub, the whole you subplot. You cut your father hit. out? Yeah. <laughs> what kind of guy are you? He's a commie. <laughs> you are? <laughs> <laughs> he, he was a commie. I, yeah, exactly. We don't want to give him any kind of attention to this. But red. his whole part is in there in the play. In, in the play. Yeah. yeah. There is also this about you. Um, I don't know, and you know I say this, I've said this before, Robin Wright is a beautiful woman. Yeah, she's good by me. <laughs> Madonna was an interesting woman. I mean, you... You have an enormous appeal to beautiful, interesting women. Think of the people you've been with. I don't know where this goes, I'm just throwing it out there. Well, I've always thought that I capitalized on their perversions. <laughs> 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 Haven't I? Yes, hey, so. yes you have. <laughs> <laughs> you, but uh, we take what we can get them. <laughs> well, you know, it's, you know, on the top of the wedding cake, you know, can you say which thing just doesn't belong, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that sometimes. <laughs> but um, Robin makes me feel pretty comfortable with it. Yeah, well, you ended up the right place. Yes, absolutely. You remember what you said to me the last time when I said to you, What's the, why, why can't you get together with Robin? You said to me something to the effect, you sure know how to hurt a guy, don't you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, I had been asking myself that question quite a bit. Other than finding the finding the, the, the means to, to make the movies that you want to make, to direct as a filmmaker, in the end, that's what you want to be, a filmmaker, right? Yeah. In the fullest range of that. You, know? you want to make movies that have an impact, speak to the soul of people, and reflect your soul. Brando. Explain Brando to me. He, there's something so magic about this guy. You know, as great an actor as he is, and great talent as he is, and as great a mind as he is, when he wants to show that. Uh, there's just something about the, the, the warmth of this guy's heart and spirit that's so, uh, it's intoxicating, you know, and, and, and it's, it's, so, it's, it's so much fun. He's got as good a sense of humor as exists, you know, and, and I think that he has a, a, a lot of indirect approaches, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, kind of, you know, he likes to have fun with people, uh, trade on people's perceptions of him and of themselves, and uh, you, you, he's provocative. You don't leave a, a sit-down with him not thinking about the conversation. Do you have any quarrel with the way, with the life choices he's made? Well, it's not my place to have a quarrel with the life choices he's made. I, I, uh, uh, Just in the interest of art. 
I'm very interested in seeing him do some more great work. And I think that, uh, I think that he is too under the right circumstances. He is. I think so. Yeah, uh, under 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 the, the right circumstances. I think that he's, uh, you know, his talent is his show of respect for the work. Um, that that talent can't be beaten down if it's if it's complete disdain. I think there's a disdain and a legitimate disdain for the things that have gone along with it so much of the time, and that's totally understandable to me. Uh, but uh, he's uh, he's at a, he has a great deal of peace. Peace. Yeah, uh, and his like I say, his humor is so intact. And, um, so yeah, I would, would I like to see him get into the main event? Yeah, very much. You talk to him about it? Oh yeah. Likely to happen? Uh, I think so. We're we're at work on a few things, so we'll knock on wood. And hope it works out. I mean, you'd be the one person that could get him to do it, probably. He'll get himself to do it when he wants to do it. He like he calls you. He'll seek out the you know people that will help motivate him, which I, I enjoy being one of those people, and, uh, and, and, I, and I hope to be successful doing that. But uh, uh, he's, uh, he's still very present. When you look around, who has it together in your judgment in a way that you can look at admiring? Their lives? Or? Yeah. Yes, just the whole <clears throat> thing has sort of found the right uh, pitch. Well, you know, even even for somebody who I might come up with, uh, you it's know, a, that's a that's, it, it's, a, really it's a transient stage. You know, you you go in and out of having it together. There is this sense in the end. I mean, as you now talk about growth and you talk about love and you found peace and constancy and connection and all that kind of stuff. You know, you none of you says I have found it. Mostly, you seem to be saying. I'm out there on the ocean, and this is the way the current flows, and I'm there, and sail on. Yeah, and if you stay on the ocean, you're going to hit some storms. Yeah. Thank you for coming. You bet. Pleasure. Thanks, Thank Sean. you. Sean Penn, we're in California. We're at the Mondrian Hotel. Uh, this conversation with Sean Penn. We thank you for joining us. Sean Penn has been called the greatest actor of his generation. Roles in such films as Casualties of War, Dead Men Walking, Sweet and Low Down have solidified his status. Here's a brief look at a remarkable acting career. You. you know, I have expected you to be the one to break ranks. And for the comfort zone, the thought crossed my mind. Well, what stopped you? My sense of honor may be a little ragged around the edges, but I don't walk out on a friend. Uh, surfing's not a sport. It's, it's a way of life. It's no hobby. It's a way of looking at that wave and saying, Hey, bud, <laughs> let's party. <laughs> you and your self-righteous code of the goddamn street. Did it pull you out of a 30-year stint in five years? Did it? No, it didn't. I did. Did it get you acquitted four times? No, it didn't. I did. So you the street your whole goddamn world's this big and there's only one rule you save your own ass i understand them parents calling for blood but they call for the wrong head i won't take a lie detector test what a lie detector test i know i ain't gonna change them guys minds but i want my mama to know the truth i want my mama to know i didn't kill any kids ain't it a killer about a hundred gross of these babies in canton they'll eat them up in l.a they glow in the dark as a matter of fact they're glowing in my crates right now hey How'd you like to come in the shadows with me and have a big baby? It's perfectly bright enough as it is, thank you. Yeah, can you say one more word to thank me? I'm gonna knock you right in the teeth. You and me are kidding me and your f***ing orders and I'll resign my rating so fast. And leave you here to run this busted up outfit by yourself. <laughs> past 10 years, Sean Penn has declared he would rather be a filmmaker than an actor. His latest film, The Pledge, is his third effort. 
as a director. It stars Jack Nicholson as a retired detective who promises a victim's parents that he will find their daughter's killer. Here is a clip from the film. There can't be such devils. There are such devils. I want to see my daughter. I think it's better if you don't go to your Jenny now. Why would that be better? Because we hardly dare to look ourselves. Who did this? We intend to find out, Mrs. Larson. I'm pleased to have Sean Penn here to talk about this film. Boy, it's clear where the title comes from, from that, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> Welcome back. Thank you. Uh, I would, before I talk about the movie, just a couple of things. Um, not smoking anymore? No. no I, I stopped on my 40th birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Was it difficult? The only reason I ask you this, because I want to talk about the film, is that about four people have been it's been essential that they smoke on this set. Mm. You, Sonny Metter, and, and a couple of others. Uh -huh. Yeah, I miss it uh, very much. <laughs> you know, well, there's no I, need to be reminding you, is There's no you, question <laughs> I love smoking. <laughs> uh, but I just felt that I was one of those bodies that was going to get attacked by it. Um, so I stopped. I was, and my kids were on me about it for a long time. And I yeah, thought, you know, at that. 40, if I go past 40, I might as well keep going. Yeah. You know? So I've got a shot, maybe. So, so the jury's out on this, but you're hanging in there. Well, they say seven years, and you regenerate most of those cells. Well, that's what so they it's say, 47. Right? <laughs> if I want to smoke, I will. After forty. <laughs> yeah, it was interesting. I just no, did take seven years to clean. I thought it was ten, but you're saying seven well, to clean just, yourself out. I'll have a chip. But I, I, <laughs> I participated in a, a documentary recently on you know, the uh, the effect of smoking in film on children watching watching it. You know, because yeah. they. They go on these moral crusades once in a while. And there was a guy yeah. who said it really well, because I don't feel any of that stuff anymore than violence being that thing. I think something went wrong earlier. But uh, they, he was the, the, the sort of moral morons of it were going into this whole dilemma. Instead of just saying, you know, this is it's bad for your health. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I knew that. <laughs> Everyone's, I think anyone that's long before they warned you, yeah. you could feel that it wasn't good for you. So, but uh, but if but I liked it for a long time, and um, so I I went on this thing having quit smoking, but I I didn't tell them that. I just I just just to say you know stop talking about these things. They're, they're much bigger issues hurting yeah. kids than this. Forty typical for you? No, no. I expected a long. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking towards 76. That's when I'll feel like me. Yeah, that's when you feel old. You've said that. Yeah. You know, at 77, you'll know you're getting older. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, I think you can make it. Is that because of your dad's death? No, I think somehow I think I've always just seen myself that way. I think I'm, you know, liberated of teeth and things like that. <laughs> I can't imagine that. But <laughs> just sitting there with Robin, sort of going, <laughs> "Darling, I remember when." <laughs> That's what I'm doing now. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way it is now. Uh, uh, darling, I remember <laughs> when things were different. That's right. <laughs> Everything's good, though, up in Marin County, huh? Yeah. Kids love it? Yeah, I think so. I yeah. think so, yeah. It's good for them. You're a small-town guy yeah. up there, aren't you? I mean, you know, you yeah. drive the kids to school and that kind of stuff. They can walk to school. Oh, they can walk. Yeah, so it's a, really, it's a great life for them. Yeah. And she likes it? Robin likes it? Yeah, I think so. It's, it's, it, it just had to get away. Yeah, and I like the idea that uh, we live in a town where certainly anything can happen anywhere, but we live in a place where they can have some independence in their youth, mm. which I think when we were in Los Angeles, you have to watch out for them in all, all the time. You can't really, they can't go off on a mile ride with their friends without, you know, you feeling that something terrible might Concern happen. Concerned because they're... Yeah. And so now they're able the to the child of somebody who's well known. Yeah, or any anybody's child out in this world in any any of the cities now, I think is is crazy dangerous, and and they're able to really experience their youth, certainly with their parents, but also with their friends and be an adventure and, and mm -hmm. that kind of thing. One son is named Dylan. Yes. Well, my daughter. Is Daughter's Dylan. Dylan. Yeah. Daughter, and Dylan Thomas or Dylan something else. Dylan, we like Dylan. Just like Dylan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me go one more then. Hopper Jack. Hopper Jack. Is that yes. Dennis and, and Nicholson? Let's say that uh, the the affection for the two of them confirmed it, but <laughs> but there was I had made a movie a long time ago where my nickname was Hopper, and 
and that, so then between that and Dennis, we liked the idea of it, and and uh, and then uh, it was something. Whatever it is now, I don't really rem recall accurately where their names came from. They just because they seem to have pre-owned them. You yeah. know, he's a hopper jack. There's just no question. No question. He's a hopper jack. Yeah. <laughs> you know a hopper jack when you see one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but Robin says that you are, I mean, with your daughter, you just, you know, while you may be a strong disciplinarian with her, it just yeah. sort of floats yeah. away. Yeah, she's got me pretty well wrapped around her. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But now what she does is she, you know, if I start annoying her with my affection, she, she, she does that. <laughs> 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 <Yeah>. <laughs> that's great. That's great. You enjoy this parental stuff. Yeah. Oh yeah, a lot. Uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but you—it's great for you. You've got your own editing stuff up there, right? Yeah, so I you work, just go upstairs and work. House. Yeah, right. Yeah. Or across whatever it is. You know? Yeah, it's upstairs. Yeah, that's nice, and be able to work at home. Yeah, yeah, it's great. And the kids wander in, and yeah. I think so much of it with kids is just that they know that they can get to you. That they, you know, so I'll, if I go downstairs, they pay me no attention. <laughs> yeah. So but they can see when they want to. They, you're in their life because they know, and I'll, if they want to talk about it, they can t I can take a break from what I'm doing. I don't have to be away during that time because the business is one where, that takes you away for these periods of time as it is, uh, shooting and all of that stuff, and especially when they're in school. So it's nice to do the post-production at the house where they can wander in on you and say, hi, okay, you're boring me, and then they leave. <laughs> <laughs> What's the best part of making a film for you? Um, well, I guess it has to be finally, finally the thing I remember best and what exhilarates me to go into making movies is, is the working, I should say more, working around actors. Yeah. Uh, and um, especially, uh, well, yes, in, in all the circumstances that I've had, I've had, you know, really had people that I think the world of and we have a great time. So that'd be the, the first thing. And I think that whatever kind of movie people make, when I go to the movies and I see these movies, whether it's a big Hollywood action movie, right on down, basically actors are the ones making the movie. Um, and, and, you know, I'll use a big action example. You know, I mean, I don't think very much of Star Wars without Harrison Ford in that part, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and, and certainly the movies I make are entirely actor dependent. So that would be. What do I like the best? That, because there's an awful lot of, you get to experience a lot of affection and, and excitement with all of that, and, you know, affection toward them. Mm. And um, so I always look forward to that. And then, of course, there's the, the, the camera. I like the camera, you know, from that point of view. I like uh, taking pictures of things, things people, going on. Yeah. Action. Yeah. yeah. Nicholson said the same thing about you. He said the reason. I just like being around him, talking about you. Mm. This friendship has gone back how long? Well, we met probably right after, sometimes shortly after Fast Times uh, at Ridgemont High. He was making a movie with Tim Hutton, and Tim and I were friends sure. from Taps, and, and uh, Tim took me up, Tim introduced us. Mm. There's a moment that I read about that, that's interesting about you, or someone wrote about it. In that you looked at Jack and you looked at Warren Beatty and you you know and and maybe Gene Hackman, as you know, as a young actor, and said, "They're doing it the way I'd like to do it. They have an understanding of a life in film, in a sense, you know." Well, they still are. Uh, um, Robert De Niro and, and and Al and a lot of people. There's still a lot of these guys who are. You know, it's a funny thing. I went recently and saw. Um, um, uh, a Van Morrison play, hmm. who regrettably is going to be doing the inauguration as well. But he, he separate from that, he he's <laughs> had to take a shot, didn't we? <laughs> <laughs> he's he is a great, and they're they're still there. I you know why isn't this on the radio all the time? Yeah. Well, I you know I I think these guys are still the functioning great ones. Yeah. You know there are these you know a few new people coming around that are stunning, and I try to get them to work with me too. Well, Bernicia would be one good example. He sure would. Yeah. yeah. But these guys are continuing. But I mean, I, I'm going to push this a little bit further. It was my notion that you thought, you know, you just admired the way they were. I mean, in other words, they, there was something about them 
and maybe more, as you've mentioned, Pacino and De Niro and yeah, others, well, that, that there was a quality of, a, of the way they approached their craft and the way they approached their professionalism. Yeah, I mean, to this day, you know, uh, Jack is uh, as professional an actor as I've ever worked around or seen. You period. Know, period, yes. And I'm, and I'm talking about now the dirty work, the, you know, really sitting down. I mean, he, he throughout the shooting of a movie, he reads, rereads his script uh, a couple of times a week. I mean, he's going through it detail, 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 always asking questions. Uh, or putting questions on the table for the two of us to come up with answers to that sort of thing, and uh, which is great because it's you, you know you can't you it's impossible to be lazy really in the presence of somebody like that, because certainly he knows how to find his leisure as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, but man, you, 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 <laughs> it, he accessing the discipline is like that to him. And, uh, well, accessing the discipline. The discipline. When he wants to focus, he right, focuses. Right. Oh, well, in other words, he can pull it down when he needs uh, it. Yeah, like nobody's business, and it's really, really great. So it's become a kind of, you know, uh, you know, I'd love to do a hundred movies with him. Any director would. Um, I've been lucky enough to do two, but it's really become a, a I think, a product, more and more productive partnership. I don't direct Jack, you know, when we're working together. We've already been talking about the project by the time we start shooting it. Enough as partners, we understanding it. You know, and he's a director also, so we really talk very much the same language on the on the project. And by the time we get to shooting, I think it's a wink and a nudge between getting it to that thing we've talked about wanting to get it, to get it to. So you're always with one eye looking at scripts, another eye thinking, is this something for Jack? Is this something that I can? bring him into? Does it make sense It for certainly him? was the case on the pledge. I mean, I, I, I went ahead and got the, my partner, Michael Fitzgerald, and I optioned the pledge on the basis of wanting right. to do it with Jack. Yeah. It was a novel. Yeah. yeah. By uh, Frederick Durand. And Rose. you read it and said, this is, this is something I want to do? Yeah. As it was? I mean, you... Well, not... No, it was good because it was a, a period Swiss detective story. Right. Uh, like a 50s era. Right. Uh, but there were elements in it because it didn't lock itself in with logic as most the thriller genre does, breaking things down from you know and, and distracting the logic so we don't know where to look. This was much more of a story which would, was Durnmutt's intention to make it a story that, but that uh, gave over the big surprise to fate, mm. and so that to me opened up all kinds of options in, in the story and in the idea of taking, uh, doing an obs obsession story. Right. Partly, you know, primarily motivated uh, on, a, on a, a research for our identity, having retired, the mm -hmm. character's retired. Just for the, that. here's a, a detective that's retiring. Yeah. And he becomes obsessed by a murder and he can't let go and everybody who's in the department looks at him with a little skepticism because they think it's not so much because of the merits of the case but his inability to let go yeah you know but what is it about this story that uh, that attracts you most i think it is this this idea that when you have you know had an entirely structured life as as we find out early in the movie when you see his military record right, right. and then into a police department and detectives division of a police department that kind of of uh, regimen and then you do the reasonable thing at a certain age you say well it's you know they're calling me old timer every day it's time to put the badge down and go fishing right and and then upon doing it the floor of your whole identity falls out and i've seen this i saw it in my my grandfather had had a life career, and when he gave it up, he didn't know. By give, he thought by giving it up, he was, it was that time, and it was time to do. It. He gave it up, and he went away. I mean, he went away in his head. Yeah. Well, lots of people, you know, go to Florida to retire, or wherever, North Carolina, Texas, yeah. and some people they just and die. It. Yeah. You know, because they it just they don't have a purpose anymore, yeah. and that's what that's what this story is about. This guy gets an opportunity to have to to give himself a purpose, and it takes over, and you become very vulnerable to the to all kinds of maybe misuse of that purpose. Mm. Yeah, because I'm watching this and thinking, on the one hand, is it that? Is it this guy is looking for something? It gives him purpose? Or is it something he knows all that, but he can't let go because of somehow 
it's not that he needed the purpose, but he is this he can't let go because there are too many people as we just saw in that scene, you know, who are putting it on the table saying, Promise? Are you gonna right. do this? You know. I mean so he's drawn in rather than looking for. That's true. Yeah, that's right. It's true. He's drawn in, but he's but out of the vulnerability. I mean, I think there are a lot of cross cross motivations happening in yeah. in, in in a way. And a lot of it is fate, which was the original intention of the piece and something that I, you know, think is underrated in film because we don't want to pay attention to anything we can't control in our lives. But mm. Roll tape. Here's a scene with Vanessa Redgrave. Whenever a good child dies, an angel of God comes down from heaven and takes the child in his arms and spreads out his great white wings. Just one quick thing about it. There are little things like this that no one knows that goes into a director's head uh, or a filmmaker's head. I asked you about the mustache, mm -hmm. his mustache, mm -hmm. and you said... Well, that I had had always a feeling that the that there was a gentleness to this character that to, to some degree re was reminiscent of, of aspects of the character that Jack played in The Border, yeah. uh, the Tony Richardson movie. And um, and so this was a kind of, just in the, in the look of him, I liked the idea of, of uh, I encouraged that look because I liked the idea of a kind of maturation of that character, you know, bringing that character who was a border patrolman in that case. To, to his retirement and putting him in this situation. And not that, that that's the specifics of the character all together, but there was something nice about the way that that sits on Jack's face, you know. Renisho told me that when you called him in Europe, he just said, I'll be there, period. You know, didn't, you don't have to pay me, I'll be there. I don't know if he said that to you, but. Uh, I know that he was, you know, quick to, to, to champion in with us and, you know, he's, I, I think of that guy as sort of the, I think he's the most inventive um, actor that's come around, you know, since I've been at it, probably. He's, a, he's, he's the most inventive new well, in, character in, on the in, field. Inventive in the sense, you know, when he does things, I know that, he, you know, uh, I, don't, I don't know where he thinks they come from, <laughs> but I can tell you that, the, <laughs> that the, from my point of view, the manifestation of his choices um, doesn't come from anywhere that anyone else is familiar with, <laughs> but it's totally real and human. So you see, and on it's, target. Yeah, I mean, there are things I've seen. He's one of the very few actors where he, I've seen him do things on screen, where in fact I it, we're talking about now. I should remind myself to have somebody make a loop of some of his scenes <laughs> when I can't sleep because I, it would just I would just exhaust myself <laughs> watching some of the things he does. That's great. <laughs> The Vanessa Redgrave. She's no, were these hard sales, or I mean, no. I you know I I uh, knew that I needed to get real home run hitters to to fill these parts because I didn't I wasn't going to have a lot of time to be nursing performances. I didn't direct many of the actors in this thing very much at all. Um, it was you know all of the in fact the people who've seen the movie when they come to me and they say oh that's so nice that detail such and such entirely was the act actors, <laughs> you know, and I knew that they would do that. This is how much I give myself credit, you know. <laughs> I picked the right people and they came in and they did that and we set the cameras to be able to cover it, but that really was the case. Um, so I knew that I needed to get home run hitters for these things, and so, you know, part of the draw, you know, I know there's some people who want to work with me. I think this, the story itself is, is something, but you also have Jack, you know, is quite, quite, the, quite the bait. Oh, but man, when he's there, people want to be there. Yeah, would you like to come do a scene with Jack Nicholson? Or are you busy? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> or, or you don't have time. You know? <laughs> Has anybody ever said, of course not. Are and the other thing is, I way? think people know that with him, you know, that extends to, you know, would you like to come have a cup of coffee with because this is, is a really great Is that the way you guy. sell it? You say, would you like to come to a scene with Jack Nicholson? I or think I might have said that. I might, I might have said that to a couple of people. <laughs> Now, why Helen Mirren is the doctor? 
I always loved her. I just yeah. think she's, you know... From the television spoiler. series or from something else? I don't know why. I've seen her in a lot of things over yeah. time. I'd run into her one time and said, God, I'd love to work with you sometime. And, and uh, she seemed to respond positively, so I thought I could mm -hmm. call her and... You've you got to listen to the back of your head of people that you have noticed yeah. over your lifetime that you'd say, man, if I had a place that would look right for them, I'd be yeah. on the phone. Yeah. 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 Sam Shepard. Sam, well, <laughs> that was a little different because Sam, <laughs> Sam had called me to come do to do a play with him, which I oh, yeah. which we just which you completed did. Yeah, yeah. in San Francisco. And um, and I just thought, you know, he's a guy who's who's had a you know this long reputation and a long career, and um, and when you're doing a play, you really need to, uh, especially since he's the writer of it. Also, I, I you know what it was. I just felt that I was going to have a better time working with him if he had worked for me first. <laughs> so I called and I asked him to come be in the play. Yeah. <laughs> now you're not going to re reprise this role in Broadway, are you? No, I don't think so. Or wherever he's going to be no. in New York. No, I think I've done my my bit with it. Yeah. You have. Yeah, I didn't. I think that I, that I don't that I'm finished doing th theater for sure. Uh, yeah. It well, was, you've done a lot of theater in your life. Yeah, I have. But I I feel from one thing, I think the medium has become something of a, um, a novelty. Uh, theater. I, yeah. You, unless you do, people do a very small theater, there may still be something effective there. For one thing, there's very few people that really write well for the theater. But, you know, Sam is a significant writer. We went in there, and you can feel 20 people who really are there to hear and see a play. It's, it's even that's that much harder to do a play. We had Nick Nolte, and myself, right. Woody Harrelson, right. a bunch of people in this thing where it becomes a kind of uh, ev event if it's in the theater because movie actors don't do it that often, or mm. and so it becomes. You feel I felt like it was more of a dog and pony show than you know in terms of the audiences and why people come to see it. I think you can you any any given town if you do a six week run of of something, you can and if you only have the real theater audience, you don't need more than ninety nine seat theaters to to get them. The rest of the people are there for some other reason, just to, to, to prove to their date that they're interested in theater or something like that. <laughs> I think I think movies have taken over the consciousness. I think yeah. we need the close-up now. I don't so therefore, that's where you want to be. I want to make movies. Yeah. yeah, that's what you want to do. Yeah. I know. I mean, you and I have had this long conversation, ongoing conversation about how you feel about acting. I won't revisit that. Mm -hmm. uh, although most of the people who know you believe that you will continue to act, not because you need to make the money to do the pl movies that you want to do, but simply because you just will. Now, are you, yeah. are, are you prepared now to say they've got it wrong? Yeah, I, I mean, it, we don't have to rehash all of that stuff. I, it's, it's, I had, I mean, even as I watched the clips from the movie, I want to go back on that set and be, see, I, it's like I said earlier, I really like, I like picking lenses. You know, I like picking camera moves. I like looking through that camera after actors have rehearsed something to find out how to catch what they did on screen. I like, I really like all of that stuff. To put it in a, in a it is the difference between acting for me is the six hours you spend at school, directing is after the bell rings and you go surfing. That's the difference. So. They're wrong. <laughs> I'm finished. That's great. Here's, I mean, I, first of all, I know how much you love surfing. During the 70s, it was poetry for you. Yeah. Wasn't it? Yeah. So it was everything. It was everything. I mean, you, it was a metaphor for life. Yeah. Wasn't it? Mm. I mean, it You're was wild, saying. it was unpredictable, it was, it was turf. It was right. everything. There's a guy, it's, I just met this guy. I'd known about him when I was a kid because they were from the next group down the right. down the beach from the Venice, term. the right. Dogtown area. The guy Stacy Peralta who's just made a documentary of that time period, not focusing so much on surfing but on the on skateboarding. Mm. And it was such a trip down memory lane to see because I saw it and it's really it was so affecting because it's that period and, and nobody's I think we're just starting to document the period now, mm. which was my youth, you know. Golden age for film too. Sure was. A real golden age for film. Yeah. You know, I mean interesting time because I mean, this was the end of the Nixon political era. Yeah, I think also the country uh, Carter. Yeah, people were used to discomfort. I think in a way. I mean, we always they say, well, you know, during the, the war, there's a big during any war, World War II, there's a big boom for the movie industry. People want to escape, 
and, and, and I've never really entirely understood the, the strict escape concept. But the 70s was, was such a time that people were so willing to put themselves on the line for things that they believed in one way or another at that time, in the, in, in the times leading up to that. And the final disenfranchisement hadn't happened. And so there was a kind of willingness to, to, to be entertained without, it, without the entertainment having the responsibility of being a pillow and always being comfortable. And so you could challenge people's emotions in a, in a more direct way. And you could make people look at themselves in a more direct way and also embrace themselves for the life they live that's reflected on the screen versus creating this life that's so much exaggerated and is finally so alienating to, to the culture to the point where now, you know, maybe the movies they're making now are in some way more dangerous to kids than they used to be because they're, you know, I, I think a, I've been accused of making bleak movies. For me, a bleak movie is a movie with bad acting in it. You know, or or a movie where they just are, are there to to light off fireworks. It's not bleak simply because it tackles dark subjects. No, I think bad acting will make a kid shoot, put a needle in his arm, or shoot his friends a lot faster than a, than a movie with some grit to it. I think you know anything that's that's because by bad acting I'm talking about a, you know just an ungenerous spirit or a contrived uh, lie, uh, which most of the stuff is. Which isn't to say that every fiction is a is a fiction but like a poem you know what is it for somebody to say to another person I love you well it, it's just you know, you know what did what did you say before there were those words there's the feeling and the feeling in two hours can be true as an entire lifetime can or it can be a lie as an entire lifetime can and I just think mostly it's really um, unheartfelt lies is most of what the American cinema is now. And in that the period we're talking about, it, it was so much the opposite. Mm -hmm. And it was why I wanted to get in, in, into movies in the first place. What I know about you, what you just defined was who you are. I mean, that really is a sense of who you are and how, without you describing it, that's you. I mean, that's sort of, a, that's your mindset about life. Well, I'm going to have you to do. watch us talk about to know what I just said. <laughs> I can never remember. No, it was very else. good. But I mean, good. it is. I, I mean, I know what I know a little bit about you from our many conversations here, mm -hmm. and it is that, and that's what people see. Um, I'm bringing a little bit back to this movie because I want to set this up. Shepard is define his character because we're going to see the scene in Sam which Shepard's character. Yeah, we're trying. You, you're trying to get him to. Re, I mean, Jack's trying to get him to reopen the case. Right. And he. Well, Sam, Sam is, you know, his, is, is Jack's essentially contemporary. They've clearly been in the, in the job together for right. a long time. There's been plenty, plenty of uh, mutual respect. But um, as a, he's been more of a, a uh, what do you call it, pencil pusher. He's been right. more of a behind the scenes guy and Jack's been more on the line. And there is that tendency to feel that those guys have, you know, gotten burned out. And I think that his old friend said that Sam Shepard plays as the lieutenant has begun to feel that he's, you know, losing the marbles. All right, roll tape. Here it is. Be 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 Betsy Fisk, these are porcupines. Okay, whoa, hold it. Just porcupines and giants and Craig. You got to get a hold of yourself, Jerry. The case is closed. I made a promise. I made it. Promise. We also, in this movie, are saying something about the extent to where obsession can take you. Mm -hmm. What he will do within a kind of informal family, specifically a young girl, Chrissy. Right. Tell me more about the idea. Well, I, uh, I think that everybody has this experience of, you know, whenever you're Whatever, how, however there's a line that you don't want to cross, but you can't. Well, yeah, but there's, specifically in this story, and what interested me also about it was that if you, if you are single-minded about something, forget whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, if you have a purpose and it's a, a single-minded purpose, say it's your work-oriented purpose or something, you know, it's, it's when you're doing that that 
you know, some great business opportunity comes over here, or you know, you meet a great woman over here. But if you're out there looking for all those things, you never run into it. Well, this sort of takes that and gives him this mission that is finding this killer. And I wanted the inadvertently the th the things that end up in other stories. You know, the, somebody goes out and looks to build the blocks to find this killer. I wanted these things to sort of happen upon him mm. because his, because his single-mindedness was so complete that, you know, the, this little girl comes into his life. He doesn't go search her out. Mm. You know, the, the little red dress comes into the, the picture because she sees this, this red dress, which is part of the M.O. of this killer is little girls and little red dresses and all of that stuff that he only has to believe in what he's doing to have all of these other things come be attracted to it. So everybody participates in his obsession. And that's always been my observation of obsession, is people participate in a, 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 There is a magnetic uh, thing to, to an obsession. It's why they can be so positive and why they can be so negative, because there's so much by the time you get to your goal, there's an awful lot of fuel that's been built up, and not only by the person with the obsession. What's your obsession? Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know. I feel, you don't know. I, I feel like a man entirely out of my mind and obsessed. Um, but the, the only thing keeping me sane is that I don't know what <laughs> is my obsession. <laughs> but you know it's there. I mean, are you serious? I know. You yeah, know I'm it's there. Absolutely you are serious. Yes. Out of your mind, trying to. Yeah, I think my life is defined by. Oh my God, am I gonna? <laughs> and I don't know what it is I'm supposed to do. <laughs> But it's something. And then, uh, so I grew up in the 70s, and I see movies, and yeah. they make that much sense. Yeah. So they're filling the time right now, Charlie, <laughs> until I, until I you figure find? out what it is that I'm, you know, <laughs> supposed to discover. <laughs> so you could come back here in 10 years, and you might be a man of the cloth. <laughs> I, no, I don't, I don't know. I think that people don't grow. At all, I've been the same person I've always been. I've gotten no closer to my goal. I think it's more likely going to be on my deathbed. When I'm there. It'll be kind of. Oh, wait! I got it. Don't take me now. Wait, wait, wait! I right. found it long past. I found it. I know I'm 77, but give me a chance. That's right. Which also relates to the pledge because you know it's it is finally my you know it's a no good deed will go unpunished story. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Can I help? <laughs> maybe. maybe. <laughs> I'll review that earlier part of the conversation yeah, and then I'll call maybe you. Maybe we'll have a few more sessions and we'll get to this. <laughs> okay, done. <laughs> It'll be okay. You will owe me a lot of money. Because <laughs> I will. Have... I'll just be your whatever. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe. <laughs> All right. Let me go back to this because the pledge is a film worth talking about. <laughs> <laughs> See, there's a lot of truth in what you're saying. I mean, you don't know, do you? No, I <laughs> and it does drive you nuts. Yeah, <laughs> you're on the you're on the borderline of sanity oh, because you can't no find question. it. There's no question. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> and there've been tendencies all along. Yeah, haven't they? Yeah. You know, you actually said once some, something great. You once said that just what you just said. I don't think we grow. And yeah. you said sometimes I think at five years at five. Forgotten what you said, but it was interesting about instincts or something. Well, oh, so or everybody is smarter and smarter than they are now. They know everything they need to know, and then, and after that, it's technology, <laughs> which hasn't helped. No. <laughs> well, all right. Roll tape. Uh, this is the end of the film, and you, Jerry and the police court are staking out uh, the killer. And Stan, who is Aaron Eckhart, tells Jerry that there is no wizard that he has wasted their time, which turns out to be not true. Roll tape. It's over. That's it. Okay, Stan. You do what you gotta do, I'll do what I gotta do. Just when you leave, don't compromise this operation. Good scene. Mm. Well, you could see all that in his face. Yeah. You know.
great actor can do that for you. Yeah, and he is that. He's a great actor. And I love this Aaron Eckhart also. The, the, I'd seen him in this movie, The Company of, in the Company of Men first. Yeah. And, uh, and I just thought, wow, he's somebody I'd like to work with a lot. Why? You know, you get around certain actors. And I'm t well, last night, you know, we're all the, um, I guess because of this, this uh, the traffic and everything, all, so many actors in town, and, and I saw uh, Benicio. What was it, the New York Film Critical Award or something? You're right, that's what's going on. And I saw Benicio and Aaron, you know, and those are two two guys. I'd like to, I, I missed having David Morris in this one. I, yeah. He was busy doing this other movie. But, um, you know, you, there's certain, certain people you get, you work with and you just, it just makes sense. And I think that if you're able to take it into more and more projects, you, you get a great benefit out of the past that you've had working together. Mm -hmm. You know, I know that I had a great time with Jack the first time, but it was even better this time. Um, and that, and Benicio, I'd worked with a little bit before. Uh, he, he did a little bit of thing in the in the Indian Runner, but I still haven't done a, a long stretch with him. I'd, I'd love to, and and so what was great was Aaron and him, in in the, that one long scene together in the pledge. Um, I I could do that every day, so I'd love to write something, the two of those guys. Yeah, David Morse was doing what? Was he doing the what's the film he's in with Meg Ryan and yeah. and Russell Crowe? Taylor Hackford's movie. Yeah, yeah, Taylor Hackford. So you couldn't get him. Right. Yeah. But I mean, you really do kind of have an ensemble that you'd like to call on to a degree. Yeah, but it grows, you know, and it, and it, and people go in different directions. And and the other thing that surprises me all the time is people get older, and so what you the parts you think of them for <laughs> yeah. at, at, at some point, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I remember Marlon Brando told me a great story about that, which I repeated to someone last night, where he had he didn't want to work for a time, and he'd been offered Ben Hur. And and then oh a year and a half passed and it just it was Academy Award night I think or something like that and he called up his lawyer because he decided he wanted to go back to work and he said well what about that chariot picture <laughs> and he says it, yeah it, it it won best picture last night it's too late <laughs> it shows you out of it <laughs> he was done it <laughs> now why haven't you put it, why there was no nothing in this for him. I listen if if uh, if there's something I'd love to do in film before you know I go, it's to do something with Marlon. Um, he, but the but well, I, I don't want to try to. F I, you don't want to do it for the sake of doing. It, you want to do it because I it want to works. come to him with a great part. Yeah. Uh, that you know, at least every other day he could enjoy being on the set. <laughs> <laughs> you know, with me annoying him. Uh, and a proper paycheck, and you know, and, and the right circumstances. I would love to to yeah. do it. It's just it's it's hard to come by. Uh, you mentioned proper yeah. paycheck. You didn't make any. I mean, you didn't you didn't ask Jack to cut. You paid him his going. Rate. I I didn't do any of the above. The I financial wasn't stuff. The, yeah, that's somebody else's. Was somebody else's deal. You, you won't deal, know part of that. My understanding is he was well compensated, <laughs> <laughs> and boy, did they get their money's worth. Yeah, this is a thirty million dollar film. They say you, you something around that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and and the best way you can spend your money in your mind is getting the best actors. Oh yeah, yeah. That. But Somebody once said casting is seventy five, eighty percent of a movie. Easy, but the way the business is now is that you you know for a person like like that to get paid what they should get paid relative to the benefit that everyone's going to have down the line, it's a big number on a risky project. So you tend basically you, you then you're left with a different kind of purse after you've done that. But that's the investment on the back of which the whole movie gets made. So all of your negative cost is coming out of that is is financed because you have that person anyway. So you have to pay that number. After that, budgets are tough, and uh, and so I had to ask quite a few favors on the other ends with actors, which I you know What's I'd a rather favor pay. You would ask? I oh. would well, we do this for less money. Yeah, and take it at the back end. Take it at the back end, or even sometimes it's less than that. You know, when I I don't uh, I, I don't make a lot of money when I direct movies, uh, partly for that reason. So you give it you up to, because you, know, you want to make room for an actor. You have to make room for actors. You usually something's coming out of your pocket somewhere down the li line. Other ways, in this case. You know, I, I also had to, as the score of this movie was very important, and and, uh, I, and Hans Zimmer came and just really um, did me an enormous favor, you know, because he had very little time. We mm -hmm. had gone down a different it's path. Good, yeah. It's a great, it's a, you know, the ending of this film, I got some other things to talk about, but the ending of the film, dictated by what? 
Uh, originally, during Matt. Really, I never. Uh, not n not in the way that I've done it here. Yeah. But um, the essence of the ending was that, um, and then really something about it was it it became kind of our our battle cry on the movie. I mean, when it, when it came down to you know, everyone knows about getting movies financed to some degree. People make movies about it. They talk about, yeah. you know, how much are you going to compromise it? Well, we knew this was our this anchor. Was, right. This is the ending we're going to do. And In other words, don't even come and try to get us to... And they did. Don't offer money had, and expect us to change the ending. Because no, the, f the financiers because supported this movie. I mean, they, they did. They, yeah. they knew... We, the first conversation we said what All right, but well let me ask the question another way. Why is this, mo this, I'm not quarreling with your ending, I'm just right. asking, you're saying this is the ending that was in the novel, so to speak. Are you? Yes. Sounds like you're on, the, <laughs> you're on trial oh, I've here. I've adjusted it. I've adjusted <laughs> it. I know, you adjusted yeah. it. Okay. But it does, it's a surprise. Yeah. I mean, is that what you like about it? Or is no. it just because it's so it's unexpected? Just, it's, it's, it, it, I, it doesn't it, fit necessarily. I mean, it doesn't. Other than? Well, I think it, it's it exactly fit. what you know happens in real life. Okay, is, that, there you go. It Explain it yeah. to me. Um, in other words, real life is not is not neatly tied up so that you have your expected conclusion. Right. There's or a great there's, this there's a great story <laughs> yeah. about a man and his wife. A great love story, a forty year marriage, a fifty year marriage. Right. And when the wife dies before the husband. In his grieving, he goes through her effects. And there's a box full of love letters, passionate love letters, from the man who early in the marriage had been his best friend. Right. And clearly they'd been in an affair at that time with his wife, who was his soulmate, who was everything. He's broken, so he goes in search of this man who's since moved back to the old country in Russia or something. So this old man, widowed, gets on an airplane, gets over there, and tracks down this other old man and says, I need to know, did this happen? And the other guy says, I don't remember. <laughs> and to me, that's what this ending is. It's, that's what happens to us in life. It's not... <laughs> I get you. That's <laughs> great. <laughs> I don't remember. So, you know, what's important? Yeah. What's... We, what do we think is supposed to happen there? Who was that person to me? And how will this resolve itself? It's all the same. It's a way of thinking that makes sense to me. And so this ending makes sense to me. It just seemed poetically more true. There's 20 other endings you could do that would also do that. Poetically more true or? The, what's poetically more true about an ending like this oh, I see. is just that it doesn't get sewn up into a neat package. And it, does, and, but, and it doesn't and you're, rob you of anything. It doesn't rob you of anything, and it you're not... It doesn't look contrived or so... Right, and, 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 and the fact, and, and the, you know, being right is overrated. He's right. <laughs> what good's it to you? <laughs> being right I mean, is there's, overrated? <laughs> well, yeah. There's no question. Right. I mean, it's, there's, you know, in this way, perhaps the movie does represent my bottom line <laughs> cynicism. <laughs> but, but I think, you know, maybe cynicism is, you know, uh, getting Call a bad it. rap. <laughs> <laughs> Help the cynicism can go a long way. That's right. <laughs> I don't know is the bottom line. That's what I like about a movie. That's what sums it up. It's, I don't. I don't. I don't know what it represents. I don't like it when I know. I like to to, to do this thing, and you tell a story, and you say, "That's a good story." Yeah. I mean that uh, that re that's a story that I can feel represents my observations of things, not because my observations of things are answered. Robin Wright Penn. She's a good one. <laughs> the best. Yeah. Oh man, uh, is she a good one? She won was it, it? Was that an easy sell? Well, it was strange because I had never. Th I didn't think of her for it for a long time. I thought not to use her because um, when I was doing a rewrite of it, what I do when I write generally is sort of I'll see the character if I don't know the actor I'm writing it for, I'll see the character kind of through squinted eyes where I'll blur it out a little bit, so, you know, but it's 
It's anybody who, in, that's the, the documentary version, real life. Now what actor, if I clear my eyes, can fill that? She seemed, excuse me, to have two, her lines were too fine for the picture that I had through my squinted eyes. And so I thought of, I wanted somebody just, just a little more, you know, a few more bends or something and with a different kind of attractiveness. And, and, uh, and I talked very seriously to a person or two in particular about it, and I, and I read people. And at the end of the day, it came down to feeling I was not going to be able to do those people who, who maybe I might have thought of, thought of to do it a service by having them do it because I was going to be in too much of a rush and they w didn't have she has this very first she has her experience and then she also has a comfort working with me I think and she's a, you know a truth machine where you know you're going to get stuff there you know you can put her in a scene with Jack Nicholson and she's going to be able to fire back and everything I, I felt like she'll cover her job now let's paint her, let's see if we can paint some of them bumps in the road. And so that's what we did is we went and tried to figure out a look for her. Promise me you're going to work with Marlon. I'll give it a good go. I'd love to. I'd love to. I mean, you know, he watches this show, so. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see. I mean, why can't we make this happen? I mean. Yeah, we got to find a, finding a good story and <laughs> keeping, <laughs> keeping his, him on the subject. <laughs> so it's, it's an interesting challenge. <laughs> I mean, it's an inside joke to, to be laughing about it, but <laughs> just because he likes to talk about other things sometimes. <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's always a pleasure to have you here. Back Thank at you. you very much. Back you at bet. you, too. Uh, the Pledge. Sean Penn. Thank you for the hour. We'll see you next time.